All right, so chapter four, accounting for merchandising operations. We want to talk about that. And so up till now, what we've been discussing and looking at uh, in the examples especially is a company that uh, was a service company. But um, generally, um, companies fall under one of three categories. They are either service companies, merchandising companies, or manufacturing companies. Uh, service companies, their product that they sell is services, obviously, such as the um, consult consulting <coughs> business that uh, the example showed us. And um, so uh, merchandising companies uh, sell products and they don't make those products themselves. They don't manufacture them. They buy them from usually manufacturers, manufacturers, and turn around and try to sell them at a profit. And then, of course, last but not least, manufacturers uh, make their products from scratch and turn around and sell those products to either wholesalers or directly to retailers. Okay, so we're going to take a look at merchandisers, the, the uh, seller of products, but they don't make those products. And so when we looked at service organizations that produced revenues, you took those revenues and deducted any expenses of the business to come up with net income. Uh, examples of service organizations, of course, uh, accounting firms would fall into that category. Law firms, uh, plumbing services, air conditioning, you name it. Or at least where they're not selling air conditioners, but serving or uh, selling the services of servicing your air conditioner. A merchandiser can be either a wholesaler or a retailer. The wholesaler would be, uh, I guess, what you would call a middleman between the manufacturer and the retailer. Uh, but the retailer can also purchase directly from the manufacturer. And so they would be, be considered a, man, a merchandising company as well. Merchandise companies again don't make the items that they sell but they have to keep track of the costs of those items and when they sell those items they have to account for the cost of the items sold and so you have some additional uh, items that are listed in a merchandisers income statement and so as you see here, comparing a service company to a merchandising company, you have an additional couple of lines in your income statement. And so you're going to take your sales and you're going to deduct, <coughs> excuse me, the cost of goods sold to come up with this intermediate uh, income called gross profit. And from gross profit, you're going to deduct other uh, operating expenses of the company to come up with net income. And we talked about this 
uh, earlier, the operating cycle of a company. For a merchandiser, it begins with the purchase of goods, the cash outlay to buy those goods, and the, the full cycle goes from purchasing those goods to uh, bringing them into their inventory to selling them either on cash or credit. Uh, if on credit, that becomes a, an accounts receivable. And once that cash is collected, then the full operating cycle for at least that transaction or group of transactions um, is complete. In a merchandiser's inventory system, <clears throat> what they have to account for is uh, the beginning inventory for the company at the beginning of the year which of course is going to be the ending inventory of the company for the prior year. To that, you're going to uh, assume that you make purchases during the year to add to your inventory. That usually is the case. And so those purchases you're going to uh, add to beginning inventory to come up with this thing called merchandise available for sale. Or I've seen uh, it listed as cost of goods available for sale even. But either way, it it is the stuff that's available for sale by the merchandiser during a particular year. Now, the merchandise available for sale must go in to one of two places. It must go into ending inventory or cost of goods sold. If the items are not sold, then it goes into end ending inventory. If they're sold, then it's going to be a co cost of the goods sold. So note here, that as long as you have enough information, you can calculate any of these things. Now, there's two types of inventory systems. One is called a perpetual inventory system, which updates the accounting records for each, each purchase and sale as, as it happens. Whereas periodic systems simply updates records for purchase and sale of the, the items only at the end of the year. And so they, they usually just, um, what they do is they, they, as they purchase items during the year, it goes into this temporary purchases account and at the end of the year, what they do is they, they take a physical inventory to figure out uh, how much is of their product is still in ending inventory. And so they know what their beginning inventory uh, for the year was. They have their purchases account that is the amount of purchases made during the year. You add those up, that's your cost of goods available for sale. And you've done your ending inventory, your physical inventory at the end of the year. What's left in inventory is your ending inventory. So the assumption is uh, what's not there is the cost of goods sold. And so what they do is they take the cost of goods available for sale that they know from beginning inventory plus purchases during the year and they subtract the ending inventory to come up with cost of goods sold.
Um, going forward, at least in uh, this section, and I th think all through the book, we're going to be using the perpetual inventory system. And the reason why is because um, it's by far more prevalent, especially in these days where um, managers need more effective information concerning um, the cost of sales and things like that. It helps them make better decisions. All right, so here we're going to talk about purchases without cash dis discounts. Some sellers of products uh, offer cash discounts when they sell on credit as a means to encourage the buyer to pay earlier. And so we'll look at that here in a second, but let's say you have a, a seller who doesn't offer a cash discount, but they do sell on credit. Um, so you have a situation here where this company, Zmart, buys $500 worth of merchandise inventory for cash. Well, simple. You just debit merchandise inventory. $500 and you credit cash for $500. Very, very simple. Now, again, this, uh, these companies who sell on credit and offer uh, sales discounts are doing so to encourage faster payment by the buyers. And so, Typical of this, you have a usually a 10-day window from the date of invoice in which the buyer can pay and take the discount. Typical discounts are 1% or 2%. And so you'll hear in the, 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 the trade industries, uh, such credit terms as 1% 10 days net 30 or 2% 10 days net 30. And what that means is that if you pay within 10 days of the invoice, you can take the sales discount, either 1% or 2% off the invoice price. The net 30 part of that is the total t amount of time in which the invoice must be paid. And so it's interpreted, let's say it's two, 210 net 30 terms. That's interpreted as you can take a 2% discount off the invoice price if paid within 10 days of invoice. If not, then the whole amount is due within 30 days from the date of invoice. And so that's what you see here. So here we have a company same company purchases $500 of merchandise on account, meaning on credit. Credit terms are 210 net 30. And so they're going to book this, just as we saw the first time, without a discount, as merchandise inventory debit accounts payable credit. Now, when it comes time to pay, And there's what an invoice might look like. When it comes time to pay, and if they pay within the discount period, here's what that's going to look like. They're going to deduct the $500 from accounts payable, so they're simply reversing that. 
the discount is taken out of merchandise inventory because it reduces the cost of merchandise inventory. And then, of course, uh, the amount of cash actually paid, 490 is credited from cash. And notice, notice how they figured out the discount. You can do it a couple of different ways. 500 times 100% uh, minus 2% or 98%, right? So notice, after this uh, payment, you've got one item, one purchase in inventory. You've now reduced it by the sales discount, so the balance in merchandise inventory is 490, not 500, and so is cash. Assuming there was no prior balance in cash, of course. All right, so what if they pay uh, late, uh, meaning after the discount period, uh, but within the invoice date? Well, they're just going to pay the full $500. They're not going to be able to take their cash discount. And so they just re reverse the, the uh, 500 out of accounts payable by debiting it. And, of course, your credit is $500 cash. Now, sometimes you are not satisfied with product, and you could do one of two things if you're not satisfied with it. Uh, you could return part of the merchandise. If so, it's called a purchase return. Or you might call up the seller and say, hey, I'm not satisfied with the quality of the uh, product you uh, sold me, but I plan on keeping it and using it. It's just not worth as much as what you sold it to me for. Uh, could you give me a price break? And so there, if it, the, the parties would negotiate some sort of reduction in the price due to unacceptable merchandise. And so let's say we're going to keep it. We're not satisfied with the quality, but we're going to keep the product. And so we call them up and ask for uh, a discount in the price, and the seller agrees. And so that's what's happening here. Zmart issues um, a $30 debit memorandum for an allowance from Trex for defective merchandise. And so that $30 is going to be taken out of uh, accounts payable out of the original 500 So now they owe 470 And, of course, you're going to reduce merchandise inventory for this buyer as well. What if, uh, what if some items are returned, part of the items you buy are returned to the seller? Well, you have that situation going on here where Zmart purchases $250 of merchandise on June 1 with terms 210 net 60. On June 3rd, Zmart returns $50 of those goods before paying the invoice when Zmart pays on June 11, it takes the 2% discount only on the $200 remaining balance. And so there are your 
uh, entries. June 1 is the original entry, including all 250 into merchandise inventory with a corresponding accounts payable. And June 3rd is your return of $50 worth of stuff. You, you debit accounts payable and credit merchandise inventory, taking it out of inventory. And then on June, June 11, you're going to calculate the discount based upon the $200 still owed, not the $250 originally purchased. And so you take, again, $200 out of accounts payable by debiting it. You credit merchandise inventory for the discount, reducing merchandise inventory by four, and the rest comes out of cash. When buyers purchase inventory, they're required under GAAP to uh, capitalize the cost, all costs of inventory, including such things as transportation in getting the product to the buyer, insurance, and such other things. So we want to look at uh, transportation costs here. And transportation costs um, really are based upon who owns the product at the time it leaves the seller's location. If the seller owns the product when the product leaves their location, then they're responsible for the transportation costs and insurance and all that other stuff. If the buyer owns the product at the time it leaves the seller, then they are responsible for insurance, uh, certainly the risk of loss. That's why you want to get insurance. And the shipping costs. And so you have two, two terms that are used in the business. One is called FOB shipping point, the other FOB destination. If the shipping terms are FOB shipping point, then the buyer owns the goods at the time they leave the seller's uh, location, the shipping point. And while they are in transit to the buyer, the buyer has the risk of loss, therefore uh, is responsible for insuring the product, as well as they're responsible for the shipping costs. Now, if the shipping terms are FOB destination, then the ownership transfers at the time the buyer receives the product. So the whole time that the goods are in transit, the seller still owns them. Thus, they are responsible for the risk of loss and in getting insurance, and they're responsible for the transportation costs. If the terms are FOB shipping point because the buyer uh, is responsible for the shipping costs, they must add those costs to the cost of the inventory. And so you see there under transportation costs paid by, notice that if the buyer uh, owns the product, the cost of the shipping is debited to merchandise inventory, not something like uh, shipping expense or shipping costs. Now notice if the, the terms are FOB destination and thus the seller 
owns the goods and is responsible for transportation costs, they would debit delivery expense. And so here, Zmart purchased merchandise on terms of FOB shipping point, meaning they own the product and must pay for the transportation costs. Here it's $75. Notice that they're just adding that $75 to the cost of the merchandise inventory. So note what you have here on a typical merchant merchandiser company. You have the invoice costs of the merchandise purchases, less purchase discounts received, less purchase returns and allowances, and any transportation costs that they, they incur in shipping goods <clears throat> to them, they add that to the cost of inventory. And so notice here they have a total net cost of merchandise purchases. Now the book indicates that uh, normally the, these numbers, uh, th these detailed numbers aren't uh, normally listed in the financial statements, but you might see them in a schedule that are part of the notes to the financial statement. Uh, one, of, one of the things you'll learn later is that the notes to the financial statement provide the, the users of information, financial information for, for companies. It provides them with supplemental information to help them make better decisions. All right, so next we're going to analyze and record transactions for merchandise sales using a perpetual system. So we just got through looking at how we analyze and record purchase transactions. So we were, we were looking at it from the standpoint of a buyer. Here we're going to look at it from the standpoint of a seller of merchandise using a perpetual system. And so again, this is what the gross profit computation looks like in a typical merchandiser's income statement. And so each sales transaction for a seller of merchandise involves two parts the revenue received in the form of an asset from a customer, usually cash, and recognition of the cost of the merchandise that was sold to the customer. So sales revenue minus cost of goods sold. And so here we have an example of a, a sale without cash discounts. Zmart sold $1,000 of merchandise on credit. The merchandise has a cost basis to Zmart of $300. And so you here, you unlike what you saw with a service company, you have two parts to your journal entry when you're selling merchandise. The first is dealing with the revenue side and here you debit accounts receivable when you're selling on credit and you credit sales revenue or sales. And then the second part of it deals with the cost side. And so you're going to debit cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is just a special type of expense account. 
the expense being the cost of the merchandise that you sell and of course your your credits going to be to merchandise inventory since you have now taken out taken that merchandise inventory or that inventory out of merchandise inventory Now again, sales discounts, we already looked at this, so we'll just go over it. But let's say you have a sale with cash discounts. They complete a $1,000 credit sale with terms 210 net, net 45. And so you have the first part of this, the same, same deal. Accounts receivable, 1,000. Sales revenue, 1,000. And then your second part of that is dealing with the cost of the, the items that are sold. And so this second part of this example deals with what happens when the buyer pays within the, the discount period. Well, they're going to receive $980 cash. And notice that the discount goes to not sales revenue. In other words, you don't back out $20 out of sales revenue. You're going to debit a contra revenue account called sales discounts instead of taking it directly out of sales revenue what is a contra revenue account well it's it's a, an account that is related to in this case sales revenue and it reduces sales revenue why why do they do it that way well I suppose the reason why is because users can see uh, the amount of gross sales and then as far as sales discounts and as we'll look here in a second sales returns and allowances how much sales discounts were taken how much sales returns and allowances uh, there were for the seller you know if you have a, especially with sales returns and allowances if they have a lot of sales returns and allowances that may, may be indicative of uh, other problems that the company might have and of course you're going to back out your one thousand dollar accounts receivable by crediting it now what happens if uh, the buyer pays after the discount period well it's simply uh, they're receiving the the buy, the sellers receiving one thousand dollars in cash that they're going to debit and they're going to credit accounts receivable for a thousand dollars in cash all right sales returns and allowances it, this is simply the the flip side of what we looked at when we were uh, talking about buyers uh, sales returns and allowances and so sales allowances would be allowing the buyer to pay a lower price but they actually keep the items even though they're, they feel somehow they're, they're not the quality that uh, they thought they would be when they bought them. And so they're keeping the items, but they're getting a lower amount. Um, whereas sales returns, the seller is actually receiving the inventory back to them. All right, so here we have an example of a customer who returns merchandise which sold for $15 and cost $9.
Well, again, you're not going to reduce sales revenue by debiting it. What you're going to do is you're going to debit sales returns and allowances. And so that's another contra revenue account. And of course, you're going to refund $15 to the customer. Now, if the returned goods are not defective, you can turn around and resell them. You're simply going to put the, the whole amount, the whole cost of the goods back into merchandise inventory by debiting merchandise inventory and crediting cost of goods sold, reducing it. Now, what happens if the goods are defective? Well, that means uh, you aren't going to be able to sell them for what it costs you. And so we have an example here where uh, merchandise inventory is returned and it's deemed to be less than worth less than what it cost the seller and in this case, it's valued at $2. And so they put it back in inventory at the $2 uh, fair value. And the $7 difference between what it cost them is credited. Well, it's actually debited, but my point is it uh, becomes a part of a loss. And so in this case, the debit is listed as loss from defective merchandise. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, again, your credit is for the whole amount of the cost of goods sold of the items that were sold but brought back into uh, inventory. All right, here's another example. Assume that $40 of the merchandise Z-Mart sold on November 12th is defective, but the buyer decides to keep it because Z-Mart offers a $10 price reduction. So again, instead of reducing sales revenues, you're going to uh, debit sales returns and allowances $10. And of course, you're going to return ten dollars cash to the buyer now what <clears throat> what if uh, what if the invoice was still outstanding what would you do well you would actually reduce the customers uh, receivable balance by ten dollars and so in that case you would uh, credit not cash but uh, accounts receivable for that customer. <clears throat> All right, well, last chapter we looked at uh, the adjustments that you make to close temporary accounts after you prepare your financial statements. I mean, the, the same uh, accounting cycle process that we talked about, the 10 steps, or nine steps really, uh, apply to a merchandising company as well uh, with some additions. And so that's what we want to talk about, <clears throat> because you've got you've got uh, some additional temporary accounts that you have to close. One of the things you might have to do 
and again they're talking here about adjusting entries one of the things you might have is you might have a situation where you do a physical in inventory at the end of the year which um, the experts say is a good idea even for a company who uses a uh, perpetual inventory system well why do they recommend that you do a physical inventory at the end of the year even though you are on a perpetual inventory system you ask because you would think that uh, if you're on the perpetual inventory system everything should be hunky-dory your your information should be correct right because you're you're tracking sales as they occur the cost of sales as they occur well um, <clears throat> the problem is that you know you have all kinds of situations in companies and one of them might be for instance um, a theft problem you might not have as much goods uh, in inventory at the end of the year as you thought and so that's why they suggest uh, doing a physical inventory even though you're on a perpetual inventory system well what happens if you go in and do your physical inventory and find that um, you don't have as much goods on your books as your records show well in that case what you're going to have to do is reduce merchandise inventory and that's exactly what we have here you're going to have to reduce merchandise inventory by crediting it here you have a, a what they call a $250 shrinkage and the corresponding debit is going to go to cost of, of goods sold so you're reducing inventory you're increasing your cost of sales now when you're doing your closing entries that first step should be the same pretty much uh, here they have sales um, I think in um, the chapter 3 when we're dealing with service company they called it either uh, service revenues or revenues or whatever they called it a uh, little di bit different nomenclature but uh, the same idea you're you're just backing out your sales zeroing that sales account out and crediting it to the your temporary income summary account uh, in step two you've got some additional uh, uh, well you've got one additional expense account and two contra revenue accounts that are temporary that you have to close out so sales discounts sales returns and allowances and cost of goods sold would be the items that you would have to close out into income summary as well as your other operating expenses everything else remains the same in step three and four though a merchandising company's ledger on May 31st its fiscal year-end includes the following accounts that have normal balances it uses the perpetual inventory system a physical count of its May 31st year-end inventory reveals that the cost of the merchandise inventory still available is six hundred fifty six dollars Prepare the entry to record any inventory shrinkage and prepare the four closing entries as of May 31st. Well, first let's identify the normal balances. Merchandise inventory is an asset. It has a normal debit balance. Com I don't know why it did that, but uh, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, again, you have that availability on those in the, um, I think, uh, the book the ebook so I encourage you to use that especially on those need to knows <clears throat>